Hello and welcome to this virtual edition of Word on the Hill, a lecture series on topics of local historical interest brought to you by the Peterborough Museum and Archives. My name is John Oldham and I'm the archivist here at the Peterborough Museum and Archives and it is my pleasure to share what little I know about our enjoyment of winter in Peterborough, Ontario, and in particular this crazy idea of strapping knives onto our feet and hurling ourselves across frozen lakes and ponds. This presentation is intended to be an entertaining accompaniment to some pretty cool historic photographs in our collection. As such, additional research will undoubtedly suggest revisions and will certainly suggest additions to the material presented. Let us know in the comments below if you know where we may have missed information or erred in our haste to bring this exciting topic to you. Now, without further ado, we bring you Skating in Peterborough. Here we sit, cozy in our houses, safe from the blustery elements of another Canadian winter. We look out the window and are reminded of winter's past, back when winter was winter. And winters were harsher many years ago, but we Canadians have always found a way to get through the long cold nights. Here we see George Street at night, looking south from Brock Street. And we've always found a way to get through snow-covered streets. Now, when we talk about skating in Peterborough, I suppose it's useful to first stop and think about why skating was and is an important feature of our lives here. To have skating, we first need two essential ingredients, water and cold. And boy, do we have water in the Peterborough area. And any of you who have wandered outside this past month will know that this is an area that can get quite cold. Water has always been important to Peterborough. Access to water was essential to its early and continued growth. Water drove industry. Here we see the west bank of the Autonomy River at about the area where Sherbrooke Street turns to join Water Street. Water carved our community in two, or rather, it divided two somewhat distinct communities, Ashburnham and Peterborough. Here we are looking south from St. John's Anglican Church on Hunter Street, down the length of Queen Street. We can see the Canadian Pacific Rail Bridge crossing the river at the top of the image. We can see a trestle and man-made causeway cutting through the river from the bridge up towards what is now PepsiCo, remembered locally as Quaker Oats but then would have been connecting to the Dixon Lumber Mills, just north of where Quaker is today. Water has given us great enjoyment in the summer months. Here we see swimmers at the boathouse that stood just north of the CP train bridge and today would be immediately east of the No Frills parking lot. But then, inevitably, things would get cold. Here we have two adorable kids waiting with their parents at Hicks Coal Yard to collect coal to keep their house warm. And when things get cold, water turns to ice. And this phenomenon of water turning to ice has given us much. It has at times given us something beautiful to look at. Now I didn't just include this image for the sake of the ice that's shown, but rather to remind myself to mention where most of the images for this presentation have come from, the Roy Studio. The Roy Studio was a professional photography studio that operated in Peterborough from the 1890s until the 1990s. They suffered a devastating fire in 1904, shown here. The temperature was well below freezing and the water that put out the fire gave the enterprising Roys some great views from which to begin rebuilding their collection. The studio itself was operated by three generations of the Roy family and comprises well over 300,000 individual images, all of which are now in the collection of the Peterborough Museum and Archives. Ice was a good thing to have because it allowed for the refrigeration of food to prevent spoilage. Originally, the ice would have been cut from natural bodies of water. This image shows a team working for Henry Calcutt out harvesting ice probably, though we're not certain in this photograph, from Little Lake. Remember the name Calcutt, we'll be coming back to him shortly. Eventually, artificial refrigeration allowed companies like Sanitary Ice Supply to create ice at will and sell it to the public for refrigeration. 
This ice had the advantage of being relatively clean, as it wasn't just cut straight from the lakes and rivers. But ice had some negative consequences as well, especially in spring when the ice began to break up. Aside from blocking water flow and causing flooding, the ice itself could be quite destructive. Here we see what happens when you build a floating bridge across a lake in Canada. This is the Shemong floating bridge that crossed Shemong Lake and connected Bridge North to Ennismore. And this kind of event would happen pretty regularly, causing the need to rebuild the bridge over and over again. Eventually the bridge was replaced by a causeway. But the real story for us today is how Peterburians, like most Canadians, learned to adapt to the harsh winters and all the snow and ice. People didn't generally hide indoors watching Olympics or using their devices or even watching recorded slideshows of historic photographs. They got out and did things, like snowshoeing and tobogganing. Tobogganing was a favorite pastime in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Friends would come together to form tobogganing clubs and would arrange parties, acquire matching knit sweaters and toques, complete with pom-poms, of course. The pom-poms, I think, were really just there to let everyone know how wild your ride was, a sort of flag to announce how much fun you were having. What do you think? My point is that people ventured outdoors enthusiastically and embraced all that Canada's winters had to offer. And why wouldn't you? Snow can be pretty fun at times. Now, frozen water has been used for sport long before Peterborough was home to European settlers. Whether for curling or hockey. And as we know, hockey doesn't even need ice to be a feature of Canadian towns. But as to the story of skating in Peterborough, we have to go back to the early days of settlement. I should perhaps note here that skating was invented in Northern Europe and imported to North America. I'm not aware of any pre-contact Indigenous skating that happened, at least not in terms of strapping blade to boot and gliding across ice, but I would be happy to be corrected on this point. And I don't think that the earliest settlers who were preoccupied with clearing the land and surviving the elements had time or opportunity to try skating either. The earliest account of skating I've been able to locate was in the 1850s, not long after the town's incorporation. Around this time, a new kind of blade that came with a holder could be easily strapped onto boots. This new kind of blade helped make skating much easier and much more accessible and therefore more popular. The local newspaper, and by that I mean the Peterborough Examiner, reported on the 8th of January, 1863, Skating in Peterborough, as elsewhere, is now all the go. The little lake last week was alive with a large number of all ages, sexes, and conditions. The most novel sight to us was the lady skaters, and such a lot of them. We saw girls of some seven years and old men of 57 on skates. Skating is a charming recreation, and it seemed to be equally enjoyed by the lookers-on as by the skaters. We hope to see this useful and rational sport kept up. And of course they got their wish. The city's first skating club was formed a week later at a meeting at Case's Hotel. They determined to build a formal outdoor skating rink, and it was soon built on Spaldings Bay. For those of you unfamiliar with the name Spaldings Bay, the bay was a wide, marshy area where Jackson Creek flowed into the Otonabee River. You can see the extent of the bay in this detail of Sanford Fleming's 1845 map of Peterborough marked in blue. You can see the Otonabee River flowing south before it turns to flow between Burnham and Hospital Points to the main part of Little Lake. The bay, as mentioned, marked the end of Jackson Creek as it flowed into the Otonabee. It was known as Spaldings Bay thanks to pioneer brewmaster Clark Spaulding, whose brewery stood on the point where George Street met the water before it continued to cross over a bridge. The bay, of course, was later filled in and the creek diverted through a culvert. And here is an image showing Spaldings Bay. In the image, we look south along George Street, 
we can see Hospital Point, perhaps better known to residents today as Del Carreri Park, jutting out into the lake at the left. And we can see the open expanse of Spaulding's Bay just to the right of the middle of this photograph. This was a convenient location as the creek could evidently be easily dammed to provide the needed water for icing the rink. Fundraisers were held and the rink was constructed. By the fall of 1863, local merchants were advertising the sale of clothing and equipment for skating. But what was really desired was an indoor rink. Enter Henry Calcutt. Calcutt was an entrepreneur. He owned a brewery in Ashburnham, as well as a line of steamboats that plied the autonomy between Rice Lake and Peterborough. Recall it was his men who were cutting ice from that earlier slide. Here we see Calcutt's brewery on what is now Burnham Street in Ashburnham. The present day Lions Club building is on this site. Calcutt was also involved in the local turf club a club of business owners, usually hotel operators and others who sold alcohol, and they promoted horse racing, gambling, and of course drinking. Sounds like a fun group. But the point here is that Calcutt had a keen interest in sport and in developing sporting opportunities in Peterborough. And so in 1870, Calcutt converted his unused flax mill into an indoor rink. In this image, we look east from the top of the old market building on Water Street that sat just south of Simcoe. We can just make out the bridge as it crosses the river, partially obscured by trees. We can see the Rogers Mill, the tall white building on the Ashburnham side. And we can even get a nice early view of a treeless armor hill in the distance. But the building marked with the arrow was of course Calcutt's flax mill, and by 1870, the indoor rink. Here's another view of the same building as seen from the top of St. John's Anglican Church. It seems that the rink was used mainly for curling and leisure skating, as no hockey seems to be mentioned in association with it. They continued to play outdoors, apparently. The area surrounding the rink was later better known as Riverside Park. A sports field and ball diamond where baseball, lacrosse, and rugby were played regularly. Skating grew in popularity and another rink was constructed in 1874, this time on the north side of Hunter Street near Elmer. In 1884, the Ashburnham rink was moved to the north side of Charlotte Street and used for both skating and curling. It was reputed to be the second largest indoor rink in Canada at the time, second only to the Victoria rink in Montreal. By 1903, the curlers and the hockey players, whose ice needs were actually quite different, decided to part ways, and a new arena was built on the south side of Brock Street for the hockey players, and named the Brock Street Arena. The Brock Street Arena was used over the years for a number of purposes, as a skating rink, a hockey rink, a roller rink, a venue for speed walking races, and later as a dance hall. Additional arenas were opened throughout the remainder of the 20th century, the Civic Arena, the Memorial Center, etc. But for a more casual look at skating, there is still the story of the toboggan run in Jackson Park. Built by the Radial Railway Company in 1906 as an entertainment feature at the end of their Jackson Park streetcar line, the toboggan run was located in what was then part of Jackson Park, but today known as Hamilton Park, south of Park Hill, east of Monaghan, and formerly the location of a limestone quarry used to construct some of Peterborough's most prominent early limestone buildings, such as the house built for Dr. Hutchison and the county courthouse. The toboggan run first existed as a three-lane toboggan run and soon expanded to five lanes. Amazingly, the run was between 1,000 and 1,200 feet long, extending right up to Jackson Creek and even extending south of Bonacord. At the top of the run was a wooden staging platform, adjacent to the railway's turnaround loop, 
within the loop itself, or at least adjacent to it, a natural ice rink was constructed. It was a popular destination for several years. The band of the 57th Regiment played there regularly. Minor improvements were made. Checking rooms were constructed. However, after a few years, the slide had deteriorated enough that it was deemed too costly to repair and that the rink would not be profitable on its own. And so all of this great fun came to an end. Now, skating on canals has been popular even before our canal was completed in the early 1900s. The area below the lift lock has been a popular location for skaters in recent years, has hosted the Under the Lift Lock Adam Hockey Tournament since the late 1950s, and was the site for many Snowfest events over the years. Here we see an employee of the city's Public Works Department flooding the canal in preparation for skating. And here we see a number of people enjoying a midday skate. Today we have many options for skating. We can skate in local arenas, on outdoor rinks. Here we see students skating outside at the Grove School in Lakefield, now known as Lakefield College. We can skate on homemade rinks, even a speed skating oval in Lakefield, or on frozen lakes and ponds. And skating remains an important part of our Canadian identity. For many, however, the best part of a day of skating is when you can finally sit down. Take those skates off and get home for a nice fireside cup of hot chocolate. And that brings us to the end of this episode. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to follow, subscribe, check back, reach out, or come to see us in person for more images, artifacts, and stories about Peterborough.